Hello, good morning, and welcome everyone uh, to the panel on the future of banking, uh, on the open finance and disintermediation of finance. Uh, thank you to Afor for the organization of this seventh annual FinTech and Regulation Conference. And it's, a, it's my honor to uh, be moderating this panel and uh, to have a deeper discussion on the questions of open finance and disintermediation of finance. I think they are uh, very topical. Uh, we expect the commission to come forward with a proposal on open finance and uh, likely some updates uh, to the payment services directive framework uh, by this summer. Uh, it's an area that entails a number of elements from uh, easier access to finance from consumers, uh, better, better customers, uh, investors protection, better use of data by our SMEs uh, and larger companies. And furthermore, we can explore whether this intermediation of finance is the way forward, and if so, how it will manifest itself. And uh, we have a excellent panel of distinguished panelists uh, today with us. Uh, so let me introduce them uh, before we open the debate. Uh, first of all, it's Santa Burgali, uh, who is the deputy governor of the Latvia's bank. Uh, she, was she was appointed the member of the council of the Latvia's bank back in June uh, 2020, uh, before she was a chairperson of the uh, FCMC. Um, she has a master degree on international economics and business. And uh, previously, she was uh, uh, working as a corporate business director as AS Citadel Bank and co chair of Finance Latvia Association's Credit Committee. Uh, next on the panel is Doris Dietze. Uh, she's the head of digital finance, payment services, and cybersecurity at Germany's Federal Ministry of Finance. Her responsibilities include the development of strategies with respect to fintechs, crypto assets, and digitalization of the financial market. She's also responsible for regulatory issues in this area, such as PSD2, Meka, Dora. And prior to this, she served as a, a speechwriter to the Minister of Finance, and she uh, graduated in law at the University of Trin, Trier, Münster, and Reading. Uh, Doris' counterpart is next on our panel from the European Commission side, uh, Jan Seysens, who is the head of Digital Finance Unit in the Directorate General for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and Capital Markets Union at the European Commission. He was previously a member and deputy head of the cabinet of Vice President Dobrovskis, a member of the cabinet of Vice President Barnier, and a team leader for financial supervision and the European Commission's Internal Markets and Services Director General. Uh, graduated in law from Humboldt University in Berlin, holds a master's degree in European law from King's College London. Uh, next on the panel is Konstantin Dagianis. Uh, he's a financial services partner in assurance practices at uh, PwC. In his role as the crypto assurance leader at PwC Germany, he helps financial institutions to understand cryptocurrencies and to address new risks and regulation in that new business area. He also audits crypto custodians and other crypto related business entities. For more than 10 years, Konstantin has been leading complex advisory and audit projects and financial services institutions and supporting his clients in transferring compliance requirements into the digitized world. And last but not least, uh, it's Hayes Budevein, uh, who is a currently general manager at the Dutch Payment Association, the DPA, has extensive experience in domestic as well as international payments related issue. He's a chair of legal support group at the European Payment Council uh, and uh, after serving several terms as a board member and vice chair of the Payment Services Committee of the European Banking Federation, uh, closely involved in PSD2 matters, open banking and the RDS of the EB Bay, EBA, sorry. So I think this is, uh, in a nutshell, the introduction of our distinguished panelists. And I think uh, let's kick off with a uh, more general and I think open question um, coming from various uh, backgrounds, from policy, from regulatory, from, from industry. I would like to invite you to share with us uh, your expectations and also main challenges uh, for, for the open finance uh, in, in Europe. Um, Santa, would you like to go first, please? Yes, uh, hello everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be here uh, and, and participate in this uh, very interesting discussion. And um, I, I'm glad to share, of course, uh, my thoughts uh, in, in form and in, in the position as a regulator in the local NCA. However, uh, we are uh, coordinating and we are the part of the, the global EU's uh, 
you know, both the, the, the capital markets, the, the SSM, and, and definitely we are looking forward to, to also, uh, you know, uh, benefit as a country as well on, on those all those uh, initiatives uh, coming forward, also open finance. Um, I believe that open finance definitely um, might increase and should increase transparency and accessibility of, of different financial services. Uh, I think it should be beneficial also for co uh, consumers uh, to have more transparent, uh, more uh, their needs-based uh, uh, products available. Uh, definitely, I think uh, uh, there should be uh, more easiness for customers to compare and actually find the best solutions for them. Uh, definitely those, um, uh, again, but uh, this uh, goes uh, in line with also those challenges and maybe uh, the, some uncertainty uh, where actually it uh, might bring all, all the economy. So definitely there is a, a challenges or expectations that uh, everyone uh, will have this level, level of playing field which means everyone uh, should be compliant uh, with, with all the regulations. And uh, therefore, we are looking forward to have common uh, specific standards on, on, on uh, disclosure, transparency of, of, of those services. Uh, and, and definitely, we do have a lot of uh, already regulation in place, such as GDPR and PSD2, and as I said, PSD3 coming uh, which definitely um, will be challenging for all market participants so one who wants to actually engage in, and, and participate in this open finance to comply with all, all, all those regulations. So uh, definitely there might be also some challenges and investments needed to uh, to invest in, in, the, in the technologies and ability to uh, to actually participate, to, to be compliant with those standards. And uh, definitely, I think um, this is the some kind of I see uh, as the new top of uh, uh, top of the top of new economy uh, evolving where artificial intelligence uh, data and, and the personalization of offering uh, will be very, very important. And, and that's where we actually striving to be. So um, I want to say that this uh, ownership of data, uh, you know, uh, proper uh, management of data uh, will be the key uh, to benefit for, for, for the consumers, for the product users, and both also to uh, increase the uh, competition between existing players, such as the banks and, and, and bigger, bigger fintechs already in the market and be open for others, other companies, also big techs coming into the, uh, you know, uh, into the, the finance area as well, uh, but the willingness to participate. We, we hear about, you know, different big techs already willing to take uh, part and play a role uh, and uh, offer those services for customers. So collaboration between uh, existing market players, those big big banks, also big fintechs, big techs, and, and uh, you know, usage of data, uh, also, you know, ownership of data. And, uh, and though uh, actually, um, you know, creating the environment where, where the customer and the product user actually gains the best out of it. So that's how I see the both challenges and the opportunities for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Santa, for, for your uh, initial considerations. And I think a very, very important point that you highlighted is, is uh, the central role of, of data and how, how the data will be created, handled, uh, protected, uh, and how, how does this fit into, into uh, the overall framework. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to pass the floor to, to Doris uh, for, for her views on, on expectations, but also challenges uh, when it comes to the open finance uh, in, in Europe. Doris, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you as well for the invitation. It's a pleasure to participate in this distinguished panel. 
Um, when it comes to open finance, I think we are currently observing three developments. During the last years, we saw an ongoing sectoral discussion in the field of banking and financial markets around the concept of open finance, which started with PSD2, obviously, and the access to data for payment initiation services and account information services. Uh, it then went on to a, a broader discussion on open banking and now finally reached uh, away the stage of the open finance discussion, which also includes, um, uh, for example, insurances and their need for data. In parallel, we see on European level during the last years, uh, several cross-sectoral EU regulation dealing with data. And some of them were of course already mentioned. Most famous one, of course, the GDPR. Then we see the Data Act, the Digital Markets Act, the AI Act, the Data Governance Act, you name it. So we see in parallel a sec cross-sectoral or horizontal discussion around data. Uh, and the third point, the third development I would like to mention here is that we also see that the distinction between the traditional banking sector and other banks, banking sectors and, un, and other business sectors is blurring. Uh, and Santa already referred to them. It's a way of a part of a data-driven digital economy and, and a way of a platform economies, which work in a way that these companies could easily expand their businesses and services from one sector to the other. Um, as long, of course, as they adhere to the existing regulation. And that is what we see, and Santa already mentioned, um, currently with big techs and finance. Um, in, in difference to traditional banking, um, for, uh, banking companies, uh, they basically started their business in, in another business sector, and then just basically use their developed data and their experience they gained there to expand and also in, in, in the field of finance. Of course, they also have to adhere to the same regulation. Nevertheless, uh, it changed a bit of the game. So these redevelopments in a way underlines, I think the, the importance of a policy concept and an idea and policy idea about how open finance could and should look like. Uh, and that concept has to bring together this banking specific or financial market specific use cases together or finance specific use cases with the cross sector of use and horizontal approaches we see on data. Um, why is that so important? And these are the expectations. Uh, that's why the expectations are here quite high. It's I think, first of all, a matter of European competitiveness in a way. Um, it's, it's about digital business models that are mostly data driven, um, which in a way, need an access on exchange to data um, uh, to, 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 to grow in a digital world. The second point is of course innovation point. Um, it could enable new business models. Santa also mentioned one, some of them with regard to consumers, but also in the business to business sector. And I think the third expectation is that's also a question of level playing field um, between I, I call them now sectoral enterprises, companies, for example, traditional banks with limited data or sector specific data and um, cross sectoral companies uh, uh, which, which are operating cross sector, which is huge, already with a huge amount of data. Um, it's also a question of level playing field. So uh, that is why I think these are the expectations when it comes to open finance. Um, the main challenges I currently see is, of course, um, how do we protect personalized data? Uh, we do have the GDPR, but it still remains the question which data can be used and which data must be available for which purpose. Um, and the second point is that, that the framework of accessing and using data is becoming increasingly complex because of the uh, sector and horizontal rules I have already mentioned. Uh, and these rules even could diverge when it comes to cross-border services. Uh, so it, it's also a complexity, a complexity issue. Mm. And uh, the third one is um, also one, uh, one challenge is um, could be legally and technical. So that's what we saw with regard to the existing um, regulations which deal with data. You always have a question how technical can data be accessed or not accessed and under which conditions. 
And that is also always a question of fees or not fees, depending. Uh, so, um, yeah. So basically, um, these are the main expectations and why I do think it's very important to have here a coherent European approach and the challenges um, which we are facing in order to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doris. And uh, thank you also for raising uh, some of the key issues in this regard, such as uh, specific sector-specific data versus cross-sectoral uh, data. I think very, very important point, uh, also alluding to the EU competitiveness in this regard. I think many, many interesting points, and I hope that we will have time also to elaborate on, on them also throughout, throughout the debate. Thank you very much. Um, now, I would like to pass to the European Commission. We have Jan Seysens uh, with us. Uh, a lot of, I think, uh, eyes watching uh, currently the European Commission in terms of working on the upcoming proposal. Uh, so Jan, uh, what would be your views on the expectation challenges and, and uh, some perspectives of open finance in Europe? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Andre, and also uh, Santa and uh, Doris uh, for already having mentioned a lot of important uh, aspects. Well, I, th I, th I would say, I mean, if one wants to really uh, promote also data-driven innovation in, in Europe, I mean, Okay, I think it's always good to have the, your eyes to uh, to the legislator. I would also have my eyes to Gaze and uh, uh, and others in the financial sector because I mean data data sharing and data driven business models in the end cannot be built by regulation. I think regulation can be an enabler, but ultimately what counts, uh, I mean, at all stages is is ultimately the private sector in a way. So in that sense, uh, uh, I think that that's that is has always been very important for us, and I think it is also very important. And if Let's say, I mean, if you if you get the balance here too much into the kind of the public side, then I think you risk to build a bit like uh, uh, you you build uh, a bit of pipe dreams, and I think that is uh, then sometimes quite risky. So I think from our side, definitely this is uh, an area where there's an, an important need, strong need also for public-private uh, cooperation. Um, on the other hand, of course, there are a couple of kind of coordination problems as well. Uh, uh, if, if my neighbor doesn't share, then I don't want to share either. If my neighbor doesn't invest, I don't either. So there is also a role uh, for some public, uh, let's say, uh, intervention. But I think the balance is important. Um, so, I mean, from our side, I think uh, I'm in the comfortable position to be able to refer to my commissioner who's spoken earlier. Actually, uh, what are from our side the key objectives here indeed? And I'll just restate that. Uh, looking at uh, data-driven innovation, open finance. I mean, the first one is really to make sure uh, that we have the framework in place, and Doris referred to this, uh, which uh, basically makes sure that the consumer is in control of his data in finance. Uh, data is sensitive, it's getting increasingly sensitive, and consumers are getting increasingly aware uh, and uh, where they share their data and what it is used for, and, and that is also important, because without, let's say, uh, the trust on the consumer side, uh, no innovation will be built uh, uh, because consumers at some point uh, will uh, put a big stop uh, uh, gap on, on this. So uh, the first and very important principle is uh, that basically consumers must be in control of their data. And I think the GDPR uh, creates a general framework for that, but more needs to definitely be done uh, to make sure this is also really implemented in practice, including in the financial, uh, in the financial sector. Um, and I think if, if that's the case, then those consumers who actually are willing to share their data or to kind of make their data available to receive in exchange for innovative projects, uh, products. And I, I think there are, I mean, it is it is not everybody and uh, we, we, we are not kind of encouraging citizens uh, to, to do that. This is a choice really for everybody. I think what we do, do realize, however, is that especially if you look at young, the younger generations, there is more and more willingness as a matter of fact. Um, uh, so if that is the case, and uh, if indeed you, uh, let's say, give a meaningful consent to your data being used, for example, uh, to have a good comparison tool or others, then indeed, I think this can also be giving rise to quite a lot of innovative uh, products, which can be positive for um, uh, for consumers and, and companies, but uh, let's say also can give an innovation boost also indeed to the financial sector in, in the EU. And it will also, I would say, is already a bit a necessity also for fin fi the financial sector, of course, to adjust. Because if, let's say, consumers are more and more uh, used to seamless, uh, let's say, integrated experiences, whether that is via your video games or whether that is via, let's say, better and better, let's say, applications uh, for your daily life, then indeed, I mean, finance also uh, needs to hold up and I think uh, is actually also holding up quite well, but it is a continuous challenge here also for the financial sector to, in a way, to, to stay abreast. 
Um, and from our perspective, we actually think kind of a balanced and solid, uh, uh, let's say, framework for open finance in, in Europe can actually support this uh, development, can also act as a kind of uh, an, an enabler for, for additional innovation uh, here in the financial sector. Because indeed, uh, and I mentioned that before, there is sometimes a bit of a coordination problem. And, and, and that's maybe where, of course, a financial sector like the one we have in Europe is a bit different from, let's say, the big techs or from uh, from other parts of the system. I mean, the big techs, they don't need to share data. They have a lot of it, basically, uh, themselves, basically. But if you are a smaller, especially if you're a smaller firm, if you're a kind of an, an intermediary, one of the, I think, together 20,000 financial firms in Europe, I mean, you have some very good data, but uh, uh, let's say you don't have everything and you may need to combine it with, uh, with, uh, with other pieces of data. And in that sense, basically, I think actually, uh, if one assumes that consumers will will have more and more demand for data driven projects, I think it's, it's especially if you have like a more diverse financial sector as we have it in Europe, actually a responsible framework uh, which uh, allows data sharing on a level playing field is actually in the in the interest of uh, of everybody. Um, and I think uh, we have, you know, that we have received, uh, let's say, advice from an expert group indeed, which is also public uh, on uh, a number of tools how this can be achieved. I think it is it is a challenge. It is not an easy one also to get this balance between the public and private, to get the balance between protection of consumers and on the other hand, enabling uh, sharing right is not an is not an easy balance. So that's maybe the first challenge I would mention. The second challenge I would mention is indeed, and uh, Doris uh, referred to it already prominently, of course, the cross-sectoral aspect of this. Uh, let's say data sharing in the financial sector is and must be part of a border data strategy. And I think uh, that data strategy is today present in, in Europe. And uh, I think a number of pieces of legislation have already been uh, agreed or are being basically uh, rolled out and are being discussed like the Data Act. Uh, so I think this is also a big, uh, let's say, an important opportunity here. Um, I think what I would want to say uh, there, however, is that, uh, let's say, what, what we need to do here is to build bridges between different, uh, between different sectors, finance, energy, uh, Internet of Things, uh, uh, platforms. Uh, we will not be able to build the one mega infrastructure where all data in Europe can be shared. I think, I mean, if only because citizens would never trust that. Basically. So we need to build bridges between the different uh, sectors. And to build a bridge, you need a strong fundament on all sides, basically. So I think, I mean, if you want uh, to work on open, open finance, one of the ways to see it is to make sure that in finance, you have a strong fundament, a strong basis on which indeed then the financial sector can also proactively build bridges uh, with other sectors. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, the, I think in that sense, it's also good to uh, to build this fundament and lay this basis, not, not to wait too long for that, because if you still, if you already have the basis, then you can already think yourself proactively, well, how would we like to build the bridges with others? If you still are busy to build your own basis, basically, then uh, maybe, uh, let's say, others will start to build the bridges and you will not be able to shape them. So in that sense, I think also... Finance has traditionally been a strongly data-driven sector. I think PST2 has put finance in on the very, uh, let's say, uh, to, uh, to front of the of the innovation agenda and also of the experience. And I think it is in the interest also of the finance sector actually to pursue this uh, this strategy, uh, and indeed on that basis uh, to build these very strong bridges with with other sectors. And this is something which, as you know, is is part of our work. So you know. The, the Digital Markets Act assists with access rights. The Data Act has been proposed with important access rights in the Internet of Things. We have proposed, uh, 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 let's say, in, in, in legislation in other areas. So I think the, the bases are being built in all in all sectors. And the Data Governance Act, I think, is an excellent framework indeed to, to ensure then this kind of cross-sectoral, uh, let's say, data exchange, uh, and to indeed also uh, from our side contribute to these bridges, basically. So those are, I think, the maybe a couple of the challenges. Um, and on our side, yeah, we are working on this, and uh, let's say, of course, still uh, uh, very interested to hear also uh, the uh, the views on the, the matter here in the panel. And looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you for for uh, raising uh, th those issues. I think now now we heard from uh, the key uh, stakeholders in terms of uh, let's say the regulators or or legislator side. Um, and I think um, I would I would maybe build on the the, the comment from Jan that uh, it's also up to uh, the private sector to uh, come up with uh, with solutions. Uh, and I think specifically on 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 those many challenges that were raised by our, our first three three panelists uh, in terms of 
protection of data, availability of data, obviously business models uh, linked to it. But I think also this, and it was already alluded a couple of times, the idea of, of uh, cross-sectoral data, or as Jan, Jan put it, uh, building bridges between between various sectors, I think very, very important point. So I think now it's, it's a, this is a great uh, scene setter for our colleagues uh, representing uh, the, the private sector and the industry. I would, I would like now invite uh, Konstantin Dagianis uh, to uh, share with us uh, his views and expectations, challenges, and maybe also comment on, on uh, what, it, what uh, we already heard from, uh, from, from uh, the three panelists. Konstantin, please. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me in this panel. I'm looking forward to this discussion. So let me let me um, phrase that a little bit. So we, we are talking about open finance and this intermediation of finance. So I think this is a, a, a huge evolution and disruption of the whole market because the first step was open banking now. And the next step basically on this evolution ladder is that we are going into the direction of open finance. So we're just adding more um, parties in the whole um, concept. And the next step is, I think, the decentralized finance, which is pretty far away still from a regulation perspective, but is coming very fast. So something has to happen there as well. So um, and of course, as as we have more and more new players in the market um, with different backgrounds, and I think that's very important because um, banks are regulated very long. They have been audited, tested. Uh, for a long time, and they have built infrastructure um, from a technological par uh, part of side, from a risk management, but from a process, process of, uh, wide as well, build a solid infrastructure. And now we are having a lot of new startups coming into that market or um, um, companies from other um, business models where this data was not a part of it or was not the data they were preparing was not so crucial so we really have like Jan said we have to build a bridge and to um, really build an understanding of how to implement um, these security measures with data privacy measures and so on and I think these um, the biggest challenge in the whole thing will be basically the cross-platform frictions because we will have different expectation and different regulation um, for specific providers um, and um, different security measures in place. So there is a, to bring that on one similar layer, um, I think that's very, very hard because you have old legacy systems, you have new fintechs with innovative systems um, to build these APIs and to um, get all these data in a, in a good way and in a transparent way um, um, out of there. So I think that's very important and the whole integration and having the right data out there is very, very important. And it will be a, a huge challenge, of course, because you have more players, different players um, than in open banking. I think the, the second uh, topic everybody touched on is basically data security and privacy. Since a lot of different new players will have access to these data and more data, um, I think that's very important. I think from a regulation perspective, there is a lot of things in place and I think that's good, but um, it's hard to implement these things for new companies with uh, smaller um, staff level. And I think that's a, a huge challenge for most of them. And I think um, it's even harder to really find a way to assess if they um, apply these regulations. If all the players in the market using this data really have addressed and comply with the regulations and have addressed all the cyber risk and all the other risks in um, managing this data. And there, I think it's, um, it's crucial to find a way to really um, have this standard and really audit this standard as well because um, if you don't do that, um, if one player in the market or one player in the whole system doesn't comply with all the regulations or doesn't address all the risk with the countermeasures, there will be a huge risk exposing the whole concept. And I think that's a very important way 
to think about it and to, to address this risk accordingly because the market is getting bigger, the whole concept is getting bigger and everybody um, has to comply with all the regulations and address all the risks. It's not only compliance, it's cybersecurity, risk management and so on. And I think this compliance gap, and we see that a lot um, between new players in the market and old players in the market, and not only the gap, but also the mindset is totally different because of course you build an uh, innovative company um, you are a startup, you may be two people at the beginning, and then you grow to 100, 150, 200, 300 people. First thing is to develop the product and make money. Um, it's not being compliant with any regulations or being secure. So, and to bring that whole concept together, I think that's a very hard part. And to get, um, of course, the banks have a pretty high standard right now, but all the companies are coming in there to bring them on that level. I think that would be a huge challenge and to have evidence that these companies are at the same level as a banking um, operation. I think that will be very, very hard for the future. And since, since um, I mentioned the, the, the space where we go to the next evolution state, where we really have automated basically the full and intermediaries, so like banks. Um, I think that's something very interesting. Of course, we are still very, very early in the blockchain area. And we are at, I don't know, 95, 96 um, of the internet era. So very, very early if you compare it with the internet. Um, but it will re-revolutionize re um, everything. And we are making the first steps to get into this direction with open finance. And um, to really bring a more accessible, a more transparent and um, a more inclusive actually as well, because then everybody who um, wants to participate in this financial market can participate without going through a bank. And I think that's a big change for the whole market. Of course, it will take time, but there are a lot of risks we have to think about and a lot of um, um, regulation which have to, have to address these risks and and be compliant with that. Thanks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Constantin, for for um, uh, your views, and I think um, well, also interesting also to hear in the in this dynamics that uh, the the private sector would expect also the regulation to come in. I think it we're we're looking at striking the right balance between uh, the expectations of various stakeholders. So I think and I think many many trends in, in, uh, in finance, including decentralization. I think uh, we will come back to it uh, in, in a moment. Um, I think we have now uh, Hayes Budevein, uh, who should uh, address us with his uh, views, having heard to uh, our previous panelists, um, Hayes, what would be your expectations, uh, challenges in, in, in the area of open finance uh, from, from your point of view? Thank you, Andre. Uh, indeed, it's an honor to be here and I, most of what's been said, I can, can of course, con concur with. Uh, I always like to go back to, to, to the basics. I mean, the first question, why on earth are we doing all this? I mean, why are we having this discussion? That is because, in my view, we are in a data economy. We are in an internal market, and it's an ever a never-ending story how to develop this internal market. Uh, and why do we want an internal market to produce better outcomes for uh, European citizens and, and, and firms and corporates, right? So that's, for me, always... Um, the the, um, the question why why we do it and of course um, open finance is so we have to be clear about the objectives what do we want to achieve um, of course from a market perspective I always would say uh, that of course regulation as little as possible and as much as, as required to be complemented by the private sector initiatives so that that's that's a no-brainer uh, the regulator can can well one could say, uh, can only produce a, 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 a blunt butcher knife where the market would need a very precise scalpel, a surgical scalpel. Uh, but but the, the, the regulation also needs to provide, let's say, the, the whetstone for the industry, for the market, to, to, to sharpen and hone their scalpels to be able to do that. That's, that's a, so provide the framework where, uh, in, in which to operate on a level, level playing field. Um, uh, op open finance itself is, is a very multifaceted issue. Of course, you can have various angles and various perspectives on, on how you look at it and what you mean with it, uh, to be honest, because uh, there are many definitions of what, what are we talking about. 
Uh, but one thing has been said many times before in the, by the previous speakers, it's about data, it's about the end user, and it's about uh, his right to, to share or not share his data. And then if you look at, well, at any uh, legal framework that you would need to, to lay the, the, the groundwork for, for something like that, it was the same with PSD2. And uh, there's one slide, I, I it's engraved in my mind by Dirk Haubry from the European Banking Authority, uh, who have, has a very nice slide, which shows that, of course, the regulator needs to sort of carefully balance, and the word balancing has been uh, said a few times before, it's a very careful balancing act because of the various and sometimes competing objectives of what you want to achieve. You want to foster innovation, you want to foster competition, uh, and each of has its own problem with platforms and so on, but it has to be secure. Uh, it has to be, um, um, uh, trust is indeed one of the things I believe that came out of the public consultation, uh, and that if there is no trust from, from the end user, they will not share their data. So that's that, that's a key issue. Cybersecurity has been, been reached. So it's, it's a very, sorry, a very, very careful balancing act. Um, what I didn't agree with, with Dirk Haube at the time, when he said we uh, will be successful, it was about the regulatory technical standards, by the way, not the level one legislation, that uh, the, the legislator, or the, in this case, the EBA would be successful if all stakeholders would be equally unhappy. I said, well, I'd rather see uh, the outcome that you are successful if all stakeholders are equally happy, because making everybody unhappy doesn't seem to be a good policy uh, ob objective. Um, Market-led. Of course, but you need a legal framework uh, as little as well that needs to be flexible. It, it cannot be too prescriptive. prescriptive. And uh, one thing you didn't mention in the uh, in the introduction, in my introduction, is I think the thing I spent most of my time on the, today, apart from my uh, general obligations, is being co-chair on behalf of, of let's say the um, the the um, uh, let's say the banking industry of the uh, multi-stakeholder group on the to be developed of, under development scheme. Uh, of the European Payments Council, which is called the SPA, the SEPA Payment Account Access Scheme, and which is exactly what I believe should be the, the model for the way forward uh, here. There's a, a very long and intensive discussions in the European Retail Payments Board where, let's say, the banks and the third parties fought each other hard. Uh, of course, the, the third parties on behalf of their customers, their end users, wanted more access, and of course, the banks well, would only deliver the, the compliance thing because, let's say, they have to give their crown jewels away for free to the newcomers uh, see John says it long. and that that usually forcing somebody to to give away stuff for free usually doesn't provide the best outcomes for the market so after very long discussions we sort of agreed that the only way forward to make uh, to produce better results for everybody including the end users would be to cooperate and build on top of what the legal framework was and that is exactly what the spa framework uh, uh, aims to, to do, build premium services based on a business model, fair distribution of value and risk, which should make what we build on top of is, is mandatory under the law, under the PSD2, that, that will remain, of course, the legal basis, which is mandatory and has to be provided for free. But on top of that, um, we are developing premium services, and it, it's not easy, it's complicated, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a miracle that we come as far as, as this. Uh, of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We are now talking about what exactly should the minimum viable product building on top of PSD2 look like and what exactly will be uh, the business model. But if we succeed there, the lesson is learned. It, it is a holistic four-corner model that we built, which starts with PSD2 premium services on top of what is mandatory, but it can easily be used because it was devised as a holistic uh, um, we cover about asset holders, asset brokers, and that could be uh, um, uh, uh, any type of data asset that could be exchanged within such a model. Uh, of course, our focus is on, on payments beyond the functionality of PSD2, but it could easily be used to share other types of data assets. Um, and that leads then into uh, open, open payments, open finance, open insurance or whatnot. Uh, but that's, of course, without, outside of our mandate. So we have to stick to the payments part. Um, but the model, uh, building on top of a legislative uh, a framework, how can you, as market participants, the two sides of the market, jointly refine that and discuss which standards will we use and so on and so forth, uh, seems to me the, the, the ultimate public-private partnership, as, as I think Jan uh, alluded to. I will leave it at that. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And then, uh, yes, uh, my apologies. Uh, thank you for actually coming uh, up with uh, with the with the SPA multi stakeholder group. And I think the work that you're doing, I think it's it's actually very important to mention it. And and indeed, a very a very practical example of of um, uh, where we can actually head in this regard. Maybe uh, we, we're quite uh, running uh, uh, into the second half of, of of our panel, so I think uh, we should now uh, try to be. Uh, sh short, sharp in terms of wh where we where we heading in in our in our debate. Um, I would like maybe now come to our our uh, stakeholders and industry representatives, uh, Constantin Hayes, uh, coming back to the name the name of the panel and actually an important uh, moment that maybe was not that much touched upon in in our opening discussion, and that's the disintermediation of finance. Uh, so. What are your views, uh, Konstantin? Uh, are we really observing this intermediation in the market? And, and what, is, what is the driver behind it in your views? So, um, I, I, well, we see that um, the, the decentralized finance market is growing. Um, of course, it's, um, um, it has, has hiccups because when a new technology comes in, um, there are all, uh, always uh, challenges at the beginning. And as I mentioned, we are very early in this market. Um, so we see a lot of uh, different projects rising with um, the market, basically market cap is growing. Um, it's still, of course, unregulated. Um, it is a total different business model. There is no CEO, there is no central entity deciding anything. The whole com it's a community driven driven bank let's call it this way and um, the services are, which are offered um, basically are well they are lending borrowing um, and they are going into payments and um, there there are exchanges and so on in this area and they, these um, DeFi models are totally automated which I think is very very innovative. Um, of course, at the beginning, you have lags in the technology and you have lags in, uh, in different data breaches or you have people manipulating the whole thing because it's still very small. It's still um, early, very early. There are no regulations, as I mentioned. Um, but I think um, the future, this will be the future so um, that you really automate. Of course, a lot of central entities try to automate their processes. But there you really automate a full business through the blockchain uh, smart contracts. And I think this is a, a new concept. And I think, as we said, um, every, um, every user should own their data and know what happens with the data. And through that uh, blockchain smart contracts, it's very transparent what happens with the data. And... Uh, the user exactly understands what kind of fees they have to pay. So it's basically full transparency of everything. And um, I think the new generation wants that more and more, and they want to be the owner of their financial, financial finances. And I think it's, it's an interesting concept, but well, there's um, still a lot of to do in this area. Um, but it's rising and it's growing and the benefits are clearly there and the, uh, the new um, users and the um, new generation see the benefits and want to use these benefits. And I think that it won't be like 100% in, I don't, I don't say that we use only DeFi in uh, 20, 30 years, but uh, there will be a total new market and we have to react on that market and understand that and understand the benefits and try to make it more risk-free, let's call it this way. It won't be zero risk, but to um, implement measures to um, address the risks and find a way for the consumers to use that, to get access to that market, because that's still an issue as well, that the usability, of course, the user adoption and the scalability is not so high as and the traditional market, but that will grow as well. So um, I think as, if we really early start helping that sector to grow, and um, that will, we, the whole market and this whole sector will, um, not the new sector as, as well as the old sector will be 
uh, will we have benefits out of it? Because banks and traditional companies have to find their role in this new kind of business model and business market. Thank you. Thank you, Constantin. And before uh, passing the floor to Case, I, I would just uh, like to remind our audience, we have the uh, uh, last 15 minutes of our panel, but uh, we'll be happy also to open Q&A session at the end of it. So if you have any, any questions, I, I saw that we already had some coming. So please uh, feel free to uh, drop your questions to, uh, to the chat. Uh, on on this intermediation uh, in the market case uh, observations any any comments from your yeah, side please I'll, I'll try to be a bit more concise um I, i'm not going to talk about defi it, it's a niche and yes something will happen but you have to always realize it's about regulation and the services itself themselves are regulated it's not the entities so uh, what do you mean with disintermediation i i have a totally different view on that yes defi is interesting uh, etc but don't underestimate the uh, the, uh, the capability of the existing uh, regulated institution to also uh, adapt. So yes, there will be uh, at least niche markets, but I don't see that mainstream. I see the, the development coming from a totally different uh, angle. And uh, what we see is banking as a service, software as a service, payments as a service, uh, embedded finance and APIs. Uh, but there's no way around that if you want to provide that service, uh, you still need a license. It's not about banks, it's about banking as Bill Gates said a long time ago. So you cannot disintermediate banking because you need a license to, to provide that service. And uh, of course, uh, incumbents, but that goes for any industry, uh, need, to, need to rethink their strategies because of digitization. Uh, where do I want to be in, in the value chain here? Uh, but you always have to realize whatever you do, it is a regulated activity, but you can outsource a lot. Uh, you can buy uh, anything you uh, you need to, to operate a financial institution. You can buy it white label from software companies. You can uh, buy banking as a service, but be the front end to your customer. Or you could say, I want to specialize and I only want to, pr to provide infrastructure to others who have the the um, have the uh, the relationship with the end with the end user so i'm much more in, in that type of, of of disintermediation but you can never i believe disintermediate the regulated institutions but by the end of the day the the banking activity is a regulated uh, activity and you, you cannot you can provide those services in in many different ways but uh, also from the European Banking Federation, it's the same service, same regulation, same supervision, and the the the, the way the what how that entity looks like can be totally different. Uh, going to a bank, uh, one of the previous speakers said that some banks you can't go to because they're mobile only, um, uh, for instance. So it, it 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 may may vary. So you have to be very precise what you really mean with disintermediation um, uh, and and where and how. Uh, but also, I mean, the incumbents are also changing and adapting, etc. And we have seen that also with, with PSD2. Uh, it was all about disintermediation. Banks were so afraid of the newcomers, the payment institutes. They were, they were here to eat our lunch, the bank's lunch. Uh, by the end of the day, we are in a cooperation model because we say we need each other to cooperate. We can't do it alone. So we came from fierce uh, fighting to a cooperation model. It took a couple of years. Uh, but I guess that's what's going to happen in, in the data economy too. Let me leave it uh, there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the for, for those observations. Actually, very, I think very very good points uh, in, in this regard. In, indeed, I think now it's now it's time actually to hear uh, some some comments and and the reactions also from uh, from our policy representatives. Uh, I would I would start again with uh, Santa and, and Doris. Uh, any any observations or comments on 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 this on these uh, events or the trends in the market, including the intermediation and and maybe a general question? Uh, I think we we had a very good uh, opening remarks on on what uh, we see expectations and and the challenges with the, with open finance. Uh, what in, in your view, having heard from from also the panelists in the, in from the industry, what in your views should not be Missing in in the proposal uh, from from the European Commission when we when we discuss, I think I think many points were already raised, but uh, in terms of priorities or in terms of the the, the key points to to address, uh, Santa, would you like would you like to start, please? Uh, absolutely, I am uh, absolutely with the uh, the the um, Constantine uh, and, and and also uh, Gais, uh, uh mentioning that uh, actually. Uh, there is a, you know, 
the, the, the this intermediation actually will um, encourage more the collaboration between existing uh, banks and existing uh, or sort of uh, financial industry with the with the fintechs and actually gain the best out of it. Definitely, uh, banks having maybe more access. Uh, to uh, to finances uh, resources to invest, and but on the other hand, they are they are big. They they might be slow, and and this collaboration uh, and with with fintechs who are who are smaller, who are uh, as more fast uh, towards innovations. But definitely, I think the whole uh, whole uh, legislative uh, um, you know uh, framework. Should not disencourage uh, innovation and and you know strive for for innovation for both existing and the new ones and definitely trying to find this right balance between uh, uh, you know level playing field uh, towards the you know a clear uh, awareness of of the the risks evolving also on on the data on the data sharing and and building the common actually. Uh, infrastructure ecosystem uh, which is resilient and uh, this is the, the 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 of the benefit for the, the consumers and that's actually what we want with the open finance and also with the disintermediation what's actually already happening thank you thank you very much uh, for, for your comments Santa Doris uh, would, would you like to follow up uh, from 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 your view uh, how how this should be reflected and and uh, what should be actually the, the the key points in in the proposal in in in, uh, in your opinion mm -hmm. yeah. yes thank you very much um, to your question what we observe when it comes to this intermediation and and then what 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 should not be missing, as you put it, uh, in an open finance framework. Uh, when it comes to this intermediation, I think one can argue how, how you name the child in a way. Um, what we at least see is that new technologies um, offer new possibilities to cut pieces out of value change and reorganize them more efficient. And therefore, somehow, at least this intermediate, this intermediate the, the existing value chain. And that's what we see example, an example in payments when wallets come on the market. And I do not want to judge us whether that's good or not good. That's not the point. I think the point I would like to make is that digitalization always means in a way that you can rearrange value change and these rearrangements will always uh, will always raise new questions when it comes to um, is that still finance or is it just technology? Is it or, or is it already finance? Is it how do we regulate it? Like a, a, tech, not a, a technical service or like a financial service? These questions are getting more and more important, and that's mainly due to digital developments we see and technology technical opportunities which are on the market. Um, so, and that is why PSD2 is responding to it. And that's um, and by, by also regulating basically very small bits of, a, of the value chain, the ones who um, the, the payment initiation services and account information services. And that is why, for example, a, a regulation like DORA, the Digital Operation Resilience Framework, now um, has a, a, a things or for season for oversight for cloud services, because these are part of a whole value chain which got uh, or got new possibilities to to be more efficient uh, by outsourcing um, or um, also taking opportunity of new services, digital services, so, uh, and that is why I think that's an ongoing discussion. We always have to follow up from policy and a regulatory perspective. When it comes to the open framework, um, what should not be, sh shall not be missing? I, I just would like to mention just two points. I think that uh, it is important that an open finance framework uh, of proposal clarifies and coordinates the independencies between existing legislation proposals and incesses economic, economical and also geopolitical, geopolitical implications. I think both is important. Uh, the open data framework has an economic dimension and it, is, it has a geopolitical uh, implication and both should be carefully assessed and it should clarify uh, in the best uh, the, uh, the coordination with other regulations, already existing regulations, to have a, a coherent framework. 
because I think that is something we learned from PSD2. There we saw we had a lot of discussion how PSD2 and GDPR interact with another. And, and these interactions um, need to be at best clarified on legal level, because if you leave that clarification to the market, it really, um, it really could, um, could, uh, could end up in, in, in a lot of inefficiencies and, and um, for the market participants. That's the first point. And the second point, I, uh, I think it would be helpful when an open data of open finance framework would leave room for private initiatives um, and standards. I think, and I really like the idea of a public-private partnership order, or, um, which was mentioned before. I think that is something we learned with the ZEPA regulation. Um, there we had a private sector initiative or ZEPA was built on a private sector initiative of standards, which were already there and was, were already developed by, private, by the private sector and then got somehow um, taken over by the legislator uh, and, and put into a regulation. And, and I think the interaction between private standards and the room for private initiatives should also be a part of an open finance framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doris. I think I think many many interesting points were raised. Uh, I saw uh, Jan nodding on some on some of them, so uh, that, that I think is a similar level of understanding. But as we are uh, getting closer to the to the end, I I have one specific question uh, from the audience uh, that is addressed to Jan. So I think I would I would uh, sort of merge uh, these two things together and and uh, uh, on one hand ask Jan for uh, some, some short reactions to what, have, what we have just heard uh, from, from Doris, from Santa, but also from, from our industry colleagues. And uh, on top of that, I will also read uh, the question that is uh, from uh, Daniel uh, from uh, Pagonext, a Santander company. Uh, Jan, uh, you have rightly mentioned that one of the objectives is put the customer in control of their data. However, a truly customer-centric data sharing framework should put the customer in the center and actually get the best of the uses of the data they, they generate, whether they are generated in finance or in other contexts. How do you see this customer-centric cross-sector approach moving forward? Many thanks. And I think we are sort of coming back to, to, the, to, the, to the issue of bridges that, uh, that, that we heard in, in the introductory remarks. And uh, I also have one more question that I will raise by the end. So I will ask Jan to be, uh, to be brief if, if possible. Please, Jan, floor is yours. Yeah, thanks. Now I'll try to be uh, to be brief. I wanted to uh, indeed to maybe to react uh, to a couple of points also which were made where I also ag agree on. Um, uh, indeed, I think Gais, you I think you gave a quite fair uh, picture of let's say the relation also of kind of uh, established banks and and newcomers and payment companies. And uh, I think I mean the PSD two experience is is far from over actually. In a way, it has only been the beginning. But I also would very much I mean our observation is also what you say exactly. In the beginning, it was maybe very much like the banks as the data holders and then small fintechs as the data users. But this picture is more and more changing. Indeed, of course, the banks have, uh, I think, have been quite good at taking up the challenge. And so actually, I mean, today, I would not really see open finance, at least if you look at it over a time perspective, I wouldn't see it as a matter of newcomers versus establishment or uh, disintermediation. Uh, because in the end, I think we see more and more that, uh, uh, I mean, even the established institutions will be on both sides of the uh, of the data exchange. They will give some data where they have it, but they will also uh, kind of access data where they do not uh, have it. If you want to provide a customer a, a kind of a comprehensive, let's say, advice, for example, maybe some of the data you may already have to do that, but others you may not have, and then you may uh, also want to access it. So I think for me very much, I mean, increasingly, maybe in the short term, one, two, three years, it will be different, but in the, over the long term, it's not very much a matter of newcomers or establishment. Um, uh, I think that that's important to highlight. The second point I want to make is also that uh, to Doris, uh, I very much agree on this uh, challenges, also the regulatory challenges, also to making sure that the system the regulatory system is very much uh, still uh, up to date. However, to the changes in the in the value chains, and I think that's certainly a topic which I think we have already done some some work. Also in our recent CID proposals, for example, we've done addressed some matters. Uh, uh, but I think that's also certainly. I mean, the supervisory authorities have given us quite a lot of additional food for thought. I think there's no main kind of evident point where there's an evident failure here, basically right now. But I think there are a couple of spots to watch, and this work needs to be uh, needs to continue. Um, that's also important. And then indeed, um, 
to the questions which were which was asked indeed on the uh, customer centric uh, uh, let's say uh, approach how is this uh, from daniel how can we see this going forward uh, well i think for me indeed uh, there is now no way around the uh, the the approach of let's say uh, bridges basically we will not i mean you, it will be a matter of building blocks and of interlinking them basically you will not be able to let's say address all types of data across the economy with a one size fits all if only because sometimes the rules need to be different. I mean, large gatekeeper platforms, uh, let's say, need to, uh, I think we all agree, give access to data without compensation for free in a way, if you want. Uh, that question of compensation, I think, will uh, to also answer maybe another question, which I think Liga had posed, will be one of the big challenges uh, also to deal with in the open finance area, uh, where the question will indeed arise, basically, uh, uh, what about compensation? And I think, uh, let's say, we have had quite a lot of feedback that indeed, maybe in PSC2, let's say, the lack of being able to uh, require compensation has led maybe to not uh, to uh, suboptimal quality of data access, basically. Uh, and uh, so encouragement maybe to look at compensation also expert group has also encouraged that but of course then I mean once you you look at it uh, it's also not uh, an obvious one because then you need to determine well wh what is the compensation how much do, how do you also make avoid that it's being used as a obstruction of access in a way uh, prohibitive basically so uh, and then you get into questions of price fixing price regulation and all the rest of it which are far from easy so this is certainly one of the uh, things which I think an open finance framework would have to address but uh, Let's say uh, what is the the uh, let's say the best solution on this is very much something up to up for uh, for different use and we have to see that basically. Excellent, thank you very much, Jan, and uh, you helped me a lot actually with addressing also the second question uh, in, in my moderating role. Uh, we are we are running uh, out of time. We are slightly over, but uh, any any comments from the panelists on on the question from from Lega in terms of how the compensation for uh, for the data from the providers to recipients should should be should be dealt with in, in open finance in. In a minute, Max. We we need to then pass the floor to to the next uh, to the next uh, part of the program. But do you have any any observations on this uh, uh, to to end the panel? Hayes, if I, if if I may, because we uh, are currently um, next Friday we will have our SPA uh, the business conditions work block of the SPA multi stakeholder group where we will exactly uh, talk about this because we now have the outcome of a cost study uh, by a consultant. Um, in, in um, 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 uh, commissioned by by the European Payment Council, so how do you then uh, calculate such some, such such compensation? What is the value and what is the cost involved for for the let's say in this case the asset holder that holds the the data of the asset owner in our case, which is the the, the customer, the end user, and what cost does this asset holder incur when it gives those data? Um, uh, with consent, of course, of the of the owner, the, the consumer, to the asset broker, which is the the TPP, the payment institution, who can uh, uh, sell a service, which is extremely difficult, uh, sort of unknown territory where we are charting charting uncharted waters, of navigating through uncharted waters. But this is sort of very fundamental because it has to be workable and attractive for both sides of the market. Otherwise, it will not not work. Uh, so we are sort of now trying to. Uh, navigate uh, and hopefully the the experience can be reused. That's that's why the hope we have. Excellent. Thank you. Sir. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, I think it was actually an ex excellent exchange. Thank you very much for your active participation to all our panelists. Uh, I think there's a lot of points that uh, I hope will be also discussed in uh, in the future. Uh, I think it was mentioned here that it will be a very careful balancing act. So I'm looking very much forward to it. Uh, and then thank you Afor for having us. Uh, I'm sorry, Nick, for being slightly too long, but I think the debate was very exciting. Now, uh, with big thanks to our panelists, I would, without any further delay, pass the floor to Nick for the next part of, of the agenda. Have a good day. Bye-bye.